Hi, so um, today I'm going to show you the update to my V40 motherboard. It's kind of a part three of it. Um, so I'd recommend you check out the other two videos. Um, I'm probably not going to go into as much depth on some of the components in this video. But made some big changes. We still have our uh, like our processor and our ROM and RAM are all still in the same places. Speaker. Big addition is down here. This chip's actually missing. But it's a uh, 74LS20. And the whole purpose of that addition is to for the AEN pin on the ISA bus. Um, I don't use it, so with that chip missing, it's not going to affect us. Uh, the main reason why it's missing, I just haven't got any on order yet. Uh, there's a jumper here, and this ties into the DAC3 line, and then it'll work with this chip here. Because the DAC3 line is tied in with the uh, onboard serial port, so what you do is you can pull this jumper off if you're going to use the onboard serial port, and that way you don't have your AEN pin cycling every time your serial port cycles. Um, over here you can see we got rid of the pin headers up here but I have two new pin headers down here. Got rid of the 8255 and if you could read that in focus it says port 61. So all this is is a latch and I've decoded, added a couple more chips to decode, right down to port 61 for this latch and it's a, only, it's a right only, you can't read it. If you look, I've labeled it, and it kind of tells you what it does. So the speaker enable, speaker go, and then there's a channel check, non-maskable interrupt enable down at the kind of there. So it's like bit zero and bit one control the speaker. I'll say it's bit four or five that does that channel check. Actually, it might even be bit three. Over here... Now I've decoded down to port 60, and I put a port E0 on there. Um, main reason I went with E is uh, it seemed like a, it was a vacant port I could use. It looks like some of the IBM PCs did use it for like some memory management, but it's not generally used for anything else. And you can see address 2 and address 2 down there. And this kind of has to do with this port 61. So port 60, 61 is going to go here. 63 will not select anything, but 64 would be enabling address line 2 there. So that's how you would select here. So you basically have two different selections here. And what it's for is your USB host. And this is lined up pin for pin. So you use a ribbon cable. I don't have a ribbon cable right now, so I used all these jumper wires. And you can see, so you would put a ribbon cable there, so you got port 60 for the keyboard, and E0 for the hard drive. I have tested port 60, it does work. And I've tested port E0, and it works as well. So, I'll show you a demo here in a minute. But the way you would address this is the data port would be uh, E0, and the command port would be E4. Keyboard, same thing. Data port would be 60. The command port would be 64. Um, I added a screen. That way we're not just blinking lights. My brother kind of made fun of me. He's like, oh, all you do is blink lights. It's like, I don't want to see lights blink. So I put a screen on here. And this is connected through to, I put it on port 0440. Use a 8255 to communicate with the LCD screen here. It's a 4 by 20 line. But something I did here is from a project a long time ago. I used port B as a control port if you're familiar with this chip. And port A is in mode 2. So B, you actually have to hit the like modem control type pins that you would call them. So when you write, you have to actually 
enable some stuff on port C to actually get it to display on port A. And what this does for us is you can read, if you're familiar with LCD screens, you can read the screen memory. So there's no, there is no video memory on the system. What it does, basically, it's going to print lines, but to scroll up, it's going to read the, the bottom line here and then write it up here. And it's all done inside of the LCD screen, not inside the 8088 here. So I'll show you a demo here. And what we're going to do is we're going to mount the hard drive and it's going to kind of display a message. I haven't got much more code than that. So you heard the, the uh, speaker. And basically, I enable the speaker for a split second just to make sure it works, and then I disabled it. And you can see, printed on here, and it shows that uh, interrupt 0E IRQ6 was triggered. And it just happens to be a coincidence that the interrupt is the same as the port there. But you can see... The hard drive did mount. Let me show you this again, looking at the drive. So, the board gets enabled, it mounted the hard drive. And it shows on there, and I'll do this one more time. So the interrupt is basically, once you mount it, it produces an interrupt. And then what you would do is you'd read the data port and it would tell you like success or fail. Now, there's a couple ways to do this. If you've ever played with any of these, there's like absolutely no documentation. I was reading one web page, it said learn Chinese and download the Chinese manual and you'll understand it better. So I don't know. We'll see what we could do with it. But there is enough stuff on USB drives that I should be able to use this. And there's two methods for this. One, I can actually tell it to like load a file. Say, let's call it boot.com. And .com is not to do with websites, if you understand DOS days. It's a 64K maximum file. Everything is included inside the file. So what I could do is I could mount it, scan it for, say, boot.com. It loads boot.com into memory offset 100 to whatever segment you choose and then it executes it and that would actually be a really easy way to go all you do is you get your usb drive you format it in a fat format copy your boot.com file over there and plug it in and it boots right up that's one method and the other method is actually reading and writing the drive sectors which i think is totally plausible and that's where we would just read in the first sector the first 512 bytes and then pass control over to the program. So in that case, you just have to improve interrupt 13, um, like with AH of like three and two. And on my website, you can see there's actually a list of the bare minimum interrupts you need to boot DOS. There's only like eight of them, if that. One of them is the timer. You have to have the timer working properly, which we do know works. So, so there you go, that's the update. Um, I guess I could talk about the keyboard real quick. So the keyboard would be an identical one of these. The difference though is these won't mount a keyboard. And I was reading, I did download its uh, manual. So this is the, the 376S and there's like a 375B, but there's also a 372. And the 372 manual, they're all start with the 372. It talks about a external firmware mode. So it's like mode two or one for drives. It's like mode six. But you, so you go in this external firmware mode and then the, this would have to do a little bit more computing, but you should be able to communicate with the keyboard in that external firmware mode. And of course, once I get that figured out, I'll post a video on that and give you guys an update. And the same thing with the drive, whether I go with booting a file off the drive or booting the drive itself, probably depends on what I can get to work the easiest first. So hopefully I'll get a, uh, a ribbon cable in soon.
make sure it works properly, but so far everything works just fine. I did check the channel check the other day, which is the non-maskable interrupt, and it seemed to work just fine as well. So, um, I guess one other note, I did try my 20 megahertz processor. This one is a 8 megahertz still. And I've actually determined, at least for now, the 20 megahertz may be too fast for the peripherals I'm using. The um, I actually have to put weight cycles in this to maintain stability at 8 megahertz. Just like, I just max it out. But um, that's what I'm thinking, is that 20 megahertz just might be a little bit too fast for these peripherals. So... Thanks for checking it out. Um, watch my website. Um, I should be putting like my BIOS on there and I'll keep it up to date. And uh, I'll try to get a diagram on there, how I connect the LCD screen and uh, code for that. So, all right.